Hello, Planeswalkers. Welcome to Partners With. I'm your co-host, Andrew. And I'm Tyler. Today, we're going to be giving a little tutorial on how to play Magic the Gathering. We're going to go over the basic rules, as well as some of the harder rules of the game. This tutorial is geared towards brand new players who have never played the game in their life, as well as any players who are more accustomed to kitchen table magic, or magic with house rules. That's right, so let's get started by talking about the object of the game. You win the game by simply bringing your opponent or opponents down to zero life. You lose the game either by having zero life or by going to draw a card from an empty library. What I mean by this is, if you go to draw a card either because of a card's effect or because it's your draw phase and your deck has no cards in it, you lose the game. In Magic, your board has a bunch of different zones. You have your deck, or library, and the battlefield, which is where all the permanents you play sit. The graveyard is where permanents go when they either die or are destroyed, where instants and sorceries go after they're cast, and where any discarded cards go. Exile is a separate zone that counts as a card being removed from the game. Card text that references destroying, sacrificing, or burying a card means that that card goes into the graveyard. Any text that references exiling or removing a card from the game means that that card goes to exile. The main difference between these zones is that there are plenty of ways to get cards out of the graveyard, but there are fewer ways to get cards out of exile. Now, let's talk about the game's resource system. Mana. Mana is what you use to play just about every card in the game. This resource is mostly generated by land cards. Land cards can be played for free once per turn, and the most common land cards are called basic lands. These are plains, islands, swamps, mountains, and forests, and they tap for one white, one blue, one black, one red, and one green, respectively. To use a land to make mana, you do what's called tapping and return the card sideways. For a basic land, this means it can generate one mana of its color and add it to your mana pool. Your mana pool is just a term to describe all of the unspent mana you have generated. Any unused mana in the mana pool disappears when the game changes phases. We'll go into what phases are in a minute. You use this mana to play cards from your hand and to activate certain abilities. A card has its mana cost up here in the top right corner. As an example, let's look at Lord Windgrace. This card says that it costs two and a black, a red, and a green. This means you must generate one mana of each of those three colors, and the two gray means you can pay two of any color of mana for it. Gray mana symbols can be paid for with any color of mana. This is referred to as generic mana. Pretty straightforward. Next, we should talk about phases. In each game, no matter what format you're playing, a turn plays out in the same phases in the same order. You have your upkeep at the start of your turn, followed by the untapped phase where any of your already tapped permanents become untapped, followed by the draw phase. On each draw phase, you must draw one card from your library unless your turn is the first of the game. After the draw step, you have your first main phase. During your main phase, you may play any type of spell from your hand you can afford, and you may play up to one land from your hand. Next up, we'll look at the combat phase, which is broken down even further into three parts. First, you declare attackers. This is when you choose which of your creatures you wish to attack and who they're attacking. After attackers are declared, your opponent or opponents you are attacking may choose to block your attackers. After blockers are declared, the attacks and blocks all happen at once, and then the combat phase ends. After combat is your second main phase, which is identical to your first main phase, except that you may only play a land card if you didn't on that first main phase. The end of a turn is considered the end phase, where any creatures that took damage and survived heal, and then your turn is passed over to the next player in the turn order. You also discard cards from your hand down to the hand limit of 7 if you have more than 7 cards in hand. We'll go more in-depth with attacking, blocking, and damage after we go over the card types. Every card in Magic has a card type. The super type of the card is described in between the card's art and its text box, along with any subtypes. There is also an unlabeled card type, those being split between permanent and non-permanent. We'll go over what's not a permanent when the time comes. But in the meantime, we're going to cover all of the permanent types. We already went over basic lands, but when it comes to lands, basic is a super type. 
You may put any number of basic lands into your deck, whereas you can only run up to four copies of any land that doesn't say basic in its card deck. And the rule of four applies to any card in the game, besides basic lands of course. The cards that make up the next largest type in the game would be creatures. Together, creatures and lands are the bread and butter of magic. Creatures may be played only on your main phases, and they cannot tap to attack or tap to activate their own ability on the first turn when they are summoned. This is called summoning sickness. We'll look at some exceptions to these rules later on. Creature cards always have a creature subtype, be it human or beast or hippo. Some cards care about creature types, like Icon of Ancestry and Mirror of the Forebears. In the bottom right hand corner of every creature card, you will find its power and toughness, in that order. A creature's power is how much damage it will deal in combat, and its toughness is how much damage it takes to kill it in one turn. Right, and as we stated earlier, we can attack with our creatures during the combat step. At the start of combat on your turn, you may choose any creatures you control that are not summoning sick to attack, and you may choose to have them attack any player or planeswalker the player controls. You can choose to have different creatures attack different targets as well. Whenever a creature attacks, you must tap it, turning it sideways. Next, on the defense phase, the opponent you're attacking, or the opponents controlling any planeswalkers you're attacking, may have their creatures block yours. Your opponent chooses which of their creatures blocks which of your attacking creatures, and they can throw multiple blockers in front of one attacker. The exception here is if their creature is tapped, they cannot block. This forces you to choose on your turn whether you want to tap and attack with a creature or leave them untapped so that you can defend yourself on your opponent's turn. Now we're going to look at artifacts. Artifacts usually only cost colorless mana, and you can do anything from generate mana to copying a creature. There are several artifact subtypes. Artifact creatures, equipment, treasures, clues, food, and vehicles. There are a lot of them. Treasures, clues, and food are fairly rare and usually come with a reminder text, but let's go over them to be safe. Treasures can be tapped and sacrificed to generate one mana of any color. Clues can draw you a card for sacrificing them and paying two mana, and you can pay two, tap, and sacrifice a food artifact and gain three life. Another rare artifact type is vehicle. Artifact vehicles have power and toughness just like creatures, and they can be used to attack or block, but the cost to use the vehicle is that you must tap any number of creatures whose total power is equal to or greater than the vehicle's crew cost. This turns the vehicle into an artifact creature for the rest of the turn. Artifact creatures are pretty straightforward. They're just creatures that happen to also be artifacts and are treated as both. Artifact equipment are artifacts that can be equipped to a creature you control. You must pay the equipment's mana cost to play it then, if you want to equip it to a creature, you must then pay its equip cost. You may pay its equip cost again to move it off of that creature and onto another one. If an equipped creature dies, the equipment simply unequips. It does not go to the graveyard. Next up, we have enchantments. Enchantments are permanents that stick around and usually have some passive effect. From making all your creatures larger, to letting you double your instants and sorceries, lots of things. There's a number of subtypes of enchantments. Uh, but you can more or less ignore Cartouche and Shrine, as they don't have any special rules. Enchantment auras attach to creatures and sometimes other permanent types, just like equipment do. The main difference is that while equipment must be cast and then equipped, auras are cast directly onto the creature, and auras can be attached to any creature, not just your own. Enchantment curses are auras that are placed onto players rather than permanents, and cause negative effects to the equipped player. Enchantment Sagas are interesting cards. They stick around for only a few turns and do something different on each of those turns. A Saga has numbered effects on it, the first effect happening immediately when the card enters the battlefield, and the second, third, sometimes fourth and fifth effects happening on each subsequent turn after it's played. After the last effect occurs, the Saga goes to the graveyard. The last permanent card type is Planeswalker. Planeswalkers are the least common card type in the game, being introduced 14 years after the game's inception, with only around 3 Planeswalkers on average being added per set. See, the world of Magic the Gathering is a multiverse, where different worlds exist that cannot interact with one another, called planes. 
Some sentient creatures are born with a planeswalker spark that, once ignited through a traumatic event, enables them to freely travel between planes. These are planeswalkers. Planeswalkers enter with something called loyalty, a number that can be found in the same corner as the power and toughness on a creature. Loyalty acts as both a health source for the planeswalker as well as their resource in battle. Planeswalker's abilities are activated by either adding or removing loyalty according to the number to the left of the ability. A planeswalker's final ability usually has a high loyalty cost and does something huge, like gain you life, draw you cards, and play cards for free, all in one effect like Ugin, the spirit dragon. This ability is referred to as the planeswalker's ultimate ability. Once a planeswalker's loyalty drops to zero, it goes to the graveyard. Any card effect that says target player can also target planeswalkers, since thematically the player is a planeswalker duking it out with other planeswalkers. Cards that say each player, however, can only hit players. And now we've covered each permanent type, so now we can go over the two non-permanent card types. These are instants and sorceries. These are the spells that do something once they're cast and then immediately go to the graveyard. They don't stick around on the board. The only difference between these two card types is that sorceries can only be cast on either of your main phases, where instants can be played anytime on any player's turn. Magic can be played in a number of different ways, with many different official formats existing. An unofficial format that you've likely played if you've only played the game at home is called Kitchen Table Magic, which is essentially when you play the game however you'd like to, ignoring any ban lists and sometimes without complete knowledge of the game's rules. It's like if you or your friends bought some magic packs when you were kids and just interpreted the rules as best you could and rolled with it. It's fine to play the game like this if you want, but if you want to go out and find new people to play with, you'll want to know the common formats. Constructed formats let you build a deck from your collection of magic cards, letting people brew powerful and focused decks. The primary official constructed format of the game is called Standard. Standard lets you build a deck of 60 or more cards, with up to 4 copies of a given card besides basic lands, but the cards can only be from certain sets. See, there are about 4 or 5 standard sets released each year, and these sets remain in standard until the final set of the following year is released, and then the oldest year sets rotate out and stop being legal in standard. This is the format you'll play in if you play Magic Arena, which we highly recommend playing, by the way. It's a free-to-play version of the game's standard format. Modern is a very similar format, and there are major official tournaments held in this format. It allows cards from 8th edition Magic onward, allowing expansion sets, core sets, and Modern Horizons. This format is very fast and sees many decks winning in the first few turns of the game. It's not a beginner's format, that's for sure. Yeah, it ain't. Commander is the format that lets you pick one legendary creature to use as your general, and you build a 99 card deck in that creature's colors. Besides basic lands, you can only run one copy of any given card. If you want to see a more in-depth explanation of Commander, you can check out our videos on the matter. Commander is our personal favorite format to play casually. Limited formats have you open sealed products and play only with the cards that you open from them. There's no ban list or card limit, since you have little control over what cards you open. Booster drafts are a fun way to play with a set of friends. You and usually seven other players each open a booster pack and choose a card, then pass the remaining cards to the next player, picking another and repeating the process until each player has a 40 card deck. This is a fun format to play if you want to play in a casual tournament with friends. Sealed is the most common form for pre-release events. A week before a new set is released, Wizards of the Coast graces players with a chance to purchase and play with the new cards early at pre-release events. You buy into the tournament at your local card shop and get six packs of the new set. You must open and construct a 40 or more card deck with these six packs and participate in a tournament with them. There are plenty of other fun formats, like Brawl, Oathbreaker, Two-Headed Giant, and Popper, but there are so many formats that we'd likely be here all day if we went over them all. You can find a list of formats on the Magic the Gathering website, along with each format's rules and ban lists. And now that we've mentioned Popper, we hope the Professor will show up at some point. Ah, packs versus singles. This is a constant debate I have with myself whenever a new set drops. I personally love buying a mountain of packs and just seeing what I get out of them. 
I love the mystery and surprise that comes with opening packs, and pulling a rare, expensive card is thrilling to me. Yeah, I know. But it may not be the greatest financial decision. You see, with packs, you obviously don't know what you're going to get. You likely won't use most of the cards that you pull, and your rares may not be worth so much. Unless you pull a foil and snaring bridge like this, prick! Yep, and it felt great when I opened that card. Anyways, Tyler does have a point. It can cost a lot to buy packs, and you probably won't get exactly what you want from them. Thankfully, you can buy cards on their own online. We usually use TCG Player and Card Kingdom to buy magic singles. And if you only need one copy of a common card from an old set, or just a playset of one card, it's a lot easier and overall cheaper to just buy the cards you need, rather than the packs that might have them in them. So yeah, you should buy packs. I mean, singles. I'm still gonna buy a lot of packs though. Don't judge me. I am. So next we're gonna take a look at the stack. The stack is an important rule of the game where you really need to have some basic knowledge before you go spell slinging with another player. Basically, whenever you cast a spell, your opponent has a window to respond. And they can respond by activating the ability of a permanent or by casting an instant. If you have more than one opponent, then each opponent will have a chance to respond in the turn order. This is called having priority. Once an ability is activated, or a spell is cast, it goes on the stack, an imaginary stack of effects. If you cast a counterspell in response to your opponent's Ulamog, the counterspell goes on top of the Ulamog in the stack, and your opponent then has an opportunity to respond with their own spell or effect, and so on. Once everyone is done adding to the stack, the stack resolves in reverse order. The most recent spell or effect on the stack resolves first. Alright, so I'm going to give an example of the stack to kind of display how it works. Let's say your opponent has an Ulamog. You want that Ulamog. You need that Ulamog. You crave that Ulamog. And you shall have that Ulamog. But you must earn that Ulamog. If you cast, say, Agent of Treachery and use its effect to target your opponent's Ulamog, they can cast Ephemerate to exile their Ulamog, so that the agent has no target. In response, you cast Counterspell against the Ephemerate. In response to that, your opponent is sad. Our stack is now the agent targeting Ulamog, followed by Ephemerate targeting Ulamog, finished with Counterspell targeting Ephemerate. Counterspell, being the most recent spell cast in the stack, will result first, stopping the Ephemerate from exiling Ulamog. With those two finished and off the stack, your agent is now free to take that sweet, sweet Eldrazi for your very own. Hopefully, that helps give you an idea of how the stack works and how it can be abused. There are all sorts of shenanigans that can be pulled off by abusing the stack. It has the potential to be a powerful tool or a dangerous enemy, depending on how adept you are at stacking your spells. Just keep the stack in mind whenever you're playing the game, especially if you're playing a Spellslinger deck with lots of instants and sorceries. Like this monster. <laughs> and now, keywords. Almost forgot about those. Keywords are longer rules that were simplified to just one or two words. This is how you get exceptions to a lot of magic rules, like Vigilance, which prevents the creature from tapping when they attack, or Haste which is essentially removing summoning sickness from the creature. There are some extremely common keywords that appear in just about every set, like flying, which means the creature can only be blocked by creatures with flying or reach, and lifelink, which means whenever the creature deals damage, you gain life equal to the damage it dealt. A powerful and common keyword is flash, which lets you play non-instant cards whenever you could play an instant. There's also flashback, which lets you pay a card's flashback cost to cast it from the grave and then exile it. Keywords can have powerful effects like these, or even sometimes just mundane things like a fight. Look at it you, green, which makes a creature do combat damage to a target creature. Or scry, which lets you look at the top card of your library and then either put it on the top or bottom of your library. Tapping and untapping are self-explanatory. Death Touch means only one point of combat damage is necessary to kill a creature. Defender means the creature can't attack. First Strike means the creature deals combat damage to a blocking or blocked creature before the other creature. 
and double strike means they do both first strike and normal strike damage. This also means they hit creatures and players twice. Hexproof and Shroud are related effects. Hexproof means the permanent can't be targeted by your enemy's effects, and Shroud means that permanents can't be targeted by anyone's effects, including your own. Any effect that does not target, like a card that says every, can still affect a permanent with Shroud or Hexproof. Indestructible means the card can't be destroyed by card effects or by damage, although it can still be sacrificed and it will still die with minus one minus one counters or having its toughness reduced to zero in some other way. Menace means that creatures can't be blocked by only one creature. Protection means that cards, the protected card is protected against, can't equip, enchant, block, damage, or target the permanent with protection. Trample means that any amount of combat damage dealt to a blocking creature after lethal damage is applied as combat damage to the player after the blocking creature has been killed. There's an interesting and in some cases infuriating interaction between Death Touch and Trample. Since Trample spills over any damage after lethal, and Death Touch makes it so that only one damage is enough to kill a creature, even if the creature is indestructible, all of the attacker's damage spills over to the defending player except the one damage it had to deal for Death Touch. It's infuriating, because I didn't know this until it was used to kill me in a game of Commander. But it's fine, I'm not salty at all. And that's all of the common keywords, or evergreen keywords as they're also known, that you need to know. Sometimes keywords are printed with reminder text in the parentheses, even regular keywords like the ones we listed above. Mainly for newer players who may not have seen them before. This is more common with keywords that are more specific to a given set, like escape or amass. Keywords are a nice way to simplify card text, so you can replace a couple of paragraphs of text with a few keywords. It's a nice quality of life thing they did that more card games should do. They might actually, I don't know, I only play Magic. Anyways, I think that just about, in that just about wraps up the ins and outs of Magic. Magic the Gathering is a fun and complex game, and with so many formats and cards you can play, there's just thousands of different combinations. It can be played with family and friends, or with strangers at a card shop for that matter. There's something for everyone in Magic. And if you like terrorizing your friends by milling away their decks, you can do that! If you want to run them over with huge stompy dinosaurs, there's an app for that. I mean, there's cards for that. Anyways, we hope that you learned something from this video. And if you enjoyed these, please give us a like! And if you want to see more from us in the future, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. Thanks for watching!